Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're now extremely fortunate that we can spend the next hour with Soren Sko, the, the CEO of Merskline, the world's largest container carrier. So please join me in welcoming uh, Soren Sko to TPM. Uh, this morning, we, we heard uh, 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 Dr. Uh, uh, Nariman uh, Barevit speak quite uh, eloquently about the uh, about oil prices. He was suggesting that oil prices could continue to go down before they go back up. Uh, what will be the impact uh, on on Maersk Line and on the container shipping industry from from fuel prices being significantly lower than than what they were just last year? Well, it's pretty obvious. I think a lower oil price. Uh is uh, or bu lower bunker price is hugely good news for 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 for, for the container uh, shipping industry. I mean, uh, bunker cost is, is uh, the, the the biggest or second biggest uh, cost item that the the industry has. So so when the fuel price drops to, into half, it's it's obviously good news. Mm -hmm. And 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 the, the and the subject of of slow steaming had come up in the context of your recent earnings. Uh, could you just uh, share with us what, what, you, what you told the market about that point? Yeah, it, an obvious uh, question uh, in, a, in a lower, lower price fuel uh, environment is whether we will, uh, we will uh, speed up the, the, the ships and, 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 and sail faster. And um, you know, I said a couple of things in connection with our annual uh, result call, and, and, and one of the things was that you know, the industry never achieved the optimum when it comes to, to slow steaming, when the fuel price was $600 and not $300. If we take a, a trade like Asia, Europe, then the optimal number of ships to deploy on a weekly rotation would have been 13 or 14 if we look at it from the point of view where, that the cost savings from going slower would be higher than the extra cost we have to add ships to the, to the service. But we actually ended up at 11. And, and, and 11 ships is pretty much the optimal uh, uh, number of ships on a weekly rotation at, 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 at a fuel cost of $300. So from that perspective, I don't see uh, the networks uh, speeding up. The other th thing that is very important to understand um, is that we have been, as an industry, adding ships to the weekly rotations. Uh, we went from eight or nine ships uh, on a weekly rotation in Asia Europe to 11 ships, for instance. And we have been adding ships in Pacific as well. Um, but all of those ships have not been used to, uh, to slow steam. Actually, half of them have been used to accommodate the fact that the port productivity has not increased in line with, with ship sizes. So uh, if you look at the U.S. West Coast, for instance, you know, our ships are spending significantly more time in port now than they did six, seven years ago due to the fact that the ships are pretty much doubled in size. Mm -hmm. What is the solution? We were talking about this the other day about about productivity. I mean, where where you know the ships are continuing to get bigger, but but as you've been saying uh, and others have said that that, that that productivity is not improving. Uh, and so, does it just mean that 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 ultimately you will be spending more time in port, and you're going to have to add ships to your rotations, or is is there an are there do you see opportunities uh, to meaningfully improve productivity? Well, I mean, every time I. I meet with a uh, terminal operator, I use the opportunity to talk about how that industry really needs to step up its game in terms of improving uh, productivity so that we can get the, get the bigger ships in and out of port uh, quicker than what we, uh, what we do today. It's, it's, it, I think it's a fact if you look at global productivity numbers that we haven't actually seen any increase in, in, in birth productivity over the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, and, and clearly that's a, that's a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we can just go out and look at the port here, unless we figure out how to get the ships in and out of port faster than what we do today, sooner or later we're gonna run out of space. Uh -huh. Okay, so I have a question from the audience that, that, that came in that I see, which is sort of apropos to what you're talking about. If you could wave your Maersk magic wand and make three wishes come true, what, <laughs> what three things would you change immediately about US ports and specifically Southern California ports? <laughs> okay. Clearly, uh, clearly, we need to figure out how we get the productivity up. And, yep. and uh, Carl Gannant from Kühnenagen said it very, very clearly in his speech. You know, both in terms of the crane productivity and in terms of the yard productivity, we we can uh, we can do it faster. 
And you know, it's not like we have to uh, reinvent the wheel here. Uh, the US ports can get inspiration from a number of other ports uh, around the, the, the world. But it's not just about port or terminal productivity. It's actually also uh, about all the other elements of the infrastructure, whether it's rail capacity, truck capacity, or uh, chassis capacity. We need to get that to work better than what it's, what it's doing today. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we seeing around the world, I mean, it, was, it just seemed to be very clear last year that, that, that I, mean, I mean, port congestion was hitting LA Long Beach last year before the labor negotiations broke down. We were seeing chassis problems. We were really seeing the issue of big ships hitting home. But at the same time, we were seeing it in, you know, we were seeing it in Europe. Uh, we were seeing it in Asia. It just seemed that all of a sudden last year, uh, uh, port congestion uh, sort of vaulted from a, a, an issue that people s talked about occasionally to a real global challenge, even to the point that you're now hearing a couple economists who are starting to say that this is not just a logistics problem, that this is actually becoming you know, some kind of trade facilitation barrier. Do, do you see it moving in that direction? Yes, the, uh, the issue is that we had a global crisis that hit very hard in 2008, 2009 container uh, volumes globally came down by 15% in 2009, and that, in a way, masked some problems that were already starting to show themselves in 2006, 2007. And then we've had a project, projected period with low growth, which has uh, hidden, hidden the issues, and in that period of time, we probably also have had significant underinvestments in many parts of the chain, and, and now suddenly, the, certainly the U.S. economy is doing uh, much better and volumes are really starting to grow and, and then we are starting to see the same problems reoccur uh, again and, and now we've kind of lost five years in terms of dealing with them. Yep. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about your, uh, about shipbuilding. Uh, you, you were quiet for, for a bunch of years after you, after you ordered the, uh, the, the, the Triple E ships, uh, but now it seems that, uh, that, that Maersk Line is stirring again in the, in the shipbuilding space. Can you, uh, can you just update us on, on, sure. on what your plans are? We, um, we, have, um, we, have, we have not made any new investment decisions in Maersk Line since 2011. For, for a number of reasons. First of all, because the, the, the Triple E series that we, we ordered at the time more or less allowed us to grow in line with markets. Secondly, because we really, and I certainly did not feel that it made a lot of sense to invest in new tonnage as long as we were destroying uh, shareholder value, as long as we had very low returns. Uh, you know, I think this industry would be a lot better place if we only bought ships when we had actually made money to be able to afford to, to buy ships. And then the third reason uh, f for us is that uh, you know, our strategy is to grow with the market. And uh, you know, we need new capacity by 2017 to be able to, to, to grow with the market. We, we announced at our capital markets day um, in September that uh, we were planning to invest about $3 billion per year in Maersline over the next uh, five years to, to grow, uh, grow with the market and replace uh, ships that are, are uh, not as uh, energy efficient as we would like them to be. Mm -hmm. And so will that be more, more 20,000 TEU ships? I mean, what sort of scale are you talking about in terms of your orders? I think we'll be ordering ships in, 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 uh, you know, in different sizes, but, but clearly, uh, clearly geared towards the, the, bigger, the bigger size, the, the triple E, and, and maybe a, a little bit smaller than that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and, and another question from the audience, which is which is sort of on this on this question. Uh, uh, this morning, uh, uh, Dr. Martin Stopford of Clarkson's uh, he warned that in his in his short uh, presentation today that the carriers have wedded their future to what he calls big steel to achieve cost cuts. Do you agree with this? I'm sorry, I didn't. That he says that carriers have wedded their future to what he calls big steel. Big Another steel, big steel, meaning big ships, in order to achieve cost cutting, is that is that true? I think it's uh, it's important for me to say uh, that uh, that the reason for my, why Maersk Line is has been able to reduce cost uh, a lot over the last uh, uh, three years is not because of big steel. I mean, actually, when you look at our fleet composition, our ship size is average for our industry. Yes, we do have some triple E's, but you know it's right now 15 ships out of uh, 
a total fleet of almost 600 ships, so they don't actually move the needle a lot on mm -hmm. our, on our aver average uh, ship size. So uh, ship sizes is not the source of the mass line's uh, competitive uh, advantage. Mm -hmm. Clearly there are trades, and in particular Asia, Europe, where you know, unless you have fairly big ships, you're not going to be competitive in the future because the, the, cost, uh, the cost structure will not be compet competitive unless you have the, the triple E's or similar ships. But, mm -hmm. but, but uh, yeah, that's how I see it. Yep. Um, let's, let's talk about your uh, uh, MSC. So, so last year was a very interesting year in terms of how it played out with the, with the, 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 the P3 being you know, very suddenly uh, turned down uh, by, the, by the Chinese and, and uh, Maersk uh, turning, you know, you turned on a dime pretty quickly and, 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 and decided to uh, 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 create an alliance with, with, with MSC. Uh, Called the uh, called the 2M, but but it, it, it's it's been very interesting for you know those of us who watch the industry to to sort of think about a Maersk MSC alliance uh, because you are uh, you're both very large companies you know you're the two largest carriers in the world and 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 yet it it seems that that knowing your knowing your cultures knowing your background that that you you couldn't have two more completely different organizations culturally and. Uh, and, and, and historically, everything, it just seems everything is completely different about these two companies. And so uh, can, can, you, can you tell us uh, a little bit about, about MSC as a, as a VSA partner and how it's going so far? Uh, what are you learning from them uh, and, and kind of how you see it playing out? You know, we, um, we had indeed a very interesting year last year when it comes to uh, VSA corporations and uh, uh, you know, we, we decided when, when P3 was not uh, possible to move forward, we decided uh, very quickly that, uh, that, that MSC would be the ideal partner for us for a number of reasons. But first of all, because we were able to, together with the MSC, due to the size, due to the, the, uh, the ship profile, that MSC has to build the best possible network, you know, where, the, where we have the lowest cost and the, uh, and, and, and the best uh, physical network in terms of uh, geographic coverage, uh, reliability, transit time, frequency, and, 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 and so on. So, so that was pre pretty clear. Um, in terms of uh, culture, then we, uh, we know the, uh, the MSC folks, of course, much better now. We have been cooperating in the Pacific, actually, for many years. But we know MSC a lot better now. And, and you know, I, there are many similar uh, uh, similarities between our two companies. There's a very high degree of trust. We have, uh, you know, a, a fairly, uh, an ability to take quick uh, decisions and implement uh, those decisions in a speedy way. Um, MSC, like us, are very interested in, uh, in continuing to drive out cost, in terms of continuing to, to become more efficient and to continue to, to deliver a, a reliable product to our customers. So, so uh, you know, we, we felt that uh, under the circumstances, and the circumstances being that P3 was not, not, not possible, that we, by and large, would get the best deal with, uh, with MSC. We have said to the market in connection with our capital markets day that, that we, are, we expect to see benefits in the order of $350 million dollars. Uh, per year when fully implemented uh, out of 3M. So that's, of course, also a key driver for us uh, in this. Mm -hmm. Just to uh, stay on the, on, the, on the topic of, uh, of alliances for a moment, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, the, the developments that, 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 that one notices through, through alliances is that, is that carriers seem to be able within alliances to adjust capacity on a tactical basis a little bit more effectively. We're seeing more uh, blank sailings. We're seeing more, you know, sort of short-term capacity adjustments uh, uh, based on, you know, different conditions that you that you see in the market. Uh, is is this true? I mean, I mean, should the market expect more uh, more short-term, uh, whether it's uh, whether blank sailings, uh, additional additional, you know, sweeper ships put into the market as need be? I mean, is there a greater flexibility that the carriers have and are implementing in terms of uh, in terms of you know, making short-term adjustments as needed that may affect uh, shippers and may affect schedules. 
you know, I, I, um, I do think that we have to recognize in our industry that, uh, that you know, volumes will fluctuate over the year and, and there are certain uh, parts of the year that are peak and some certain parts that are trough. And, and from, a, from a carrier perspective, it's just much more efficient to adjust the, uh, the network capacity than it is to, to adjust, uh, adjust prices. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna drive more volume just because we lower the price. So, uh, so it's, it's better for us to, to lower our cost and mm -hmm. take out capacity when we cannot uh, not fill, the, uh, sh fill the ships. Uh, and you know, I think that kind of thinking is also becoming more uh, prevalent in the, in the VSA, uh, VSA arrangements. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, just an, an, another question from, from the audience. Uh, uh, this is concerning uh, 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 service contract negotiations, which in the eastbound transpac are coming up now. Yeah. Uh, every year, BCOs and steamship lines sit down at the table. Uh, is, it a, is the model outdated? Is there a better way? Uh, is it feasible to have KPIs in the contract with penalties for non-performance? I, I, th I think that we, uh, as, as, as a carrier, a mass line would be be very happy to, uh, to to entertain discussions about contracts with uh, KPIs and, 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 and commitments, you know, as long as those are, are, are two-way commitments. Uh, clearly, if we make a contract, we have a commitment to provide uh, uh, space, uh, but, but, the, but the, co the shippers also have a commitment to actually deliver the volumes. Uh, you know, and it's not just the carriers that not always live up to their uh, commitments. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you still seeing that continuously? Because that's been a to that's been a topic uh, that's you know been discussed quite a bit over the years, where you know MQCs aren't fully uh, del delivered upon, and, uh, uh, and and bookings will be made, and and then and then the cargo doesn't show up. Uh, to what extent is this, is this an issue that you're continuing to wrestle with? It is clearly an issue that we continue to to wrestle with, and, and certain parts of the uh, the year, you know, the downfall ratios are significant. Mm -hmm. and, and that, of course, means that our planning becomes uh, so much more difficult. We have to assume a certain level of uh, no-shows, and then sometimes we get the, the, uh, the uh, assumptions wrong, wrong, and that will, end in, that will mean rolling people's cargo or, or sailing with empty ships, yep. neither, okay. neither of which are very attractive options for us. Okay. And just on a related question, this is another question from the audience. Can you shed, shed light on Maersk's strategy as it relates to cu customer service in the, next, uh, in the next year or two? I mean, you were here giving the keynote speech two years ago. Uh, you devoted a lot of your speech to your, to your customer charter. Uh, uh, maybe you could speak to that. Certainly. I'm happy to speak to that. I mean, we, uh, yeah, two years ago, we launched the, the customer charter where we, in eight specific areas, uh, measure our performance and and have made, uh, let's say, promises to our customers. Since then, two things have happened. First of all, we have made significant progress on, on the various measures. Two years ago, one of the big issues we had were, were invoice quality, for instance, uh, and, uh, and customers uh, rightfully complained that our invoice quality was well below the average of the industry. We have solved that problem uh, and are doing much better. Not that we are perfect, not by any stretch of the imagination, but, but we have We've gotten a lot better, and in pretty much all of the metrics that we are now measuring on, uh, we've we've improved our performance. But the second thing that has happened is that we have we are today capable to provide customer-specific data. So not just how is Maersline doing in, in in North America, but actually for all of our key clients in North America, we are able to on a monthly basis provide data on how we're doing. In terms of accessibility, are we picking up the phone when you call us? You know, yeah. how we're we doing on booking turn time, on documentation turn time, uh, invoice quality, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, so I think the customer charter it's it's been very helpful for us in terms of, uh, of getting a, a shared vocabulary around what does good customer service mean, and 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 uh, for Maersline as well, it's part of our GN DNA and cult company culture that uh, what, what gets measured gets done, and, and I think that's had, had been helpful in, helpful in driving performance. Okay. There's still a long way to go mm -hmm. uh, in terms of providing uh, better customer service, but uh, together with the customer charter, or our customer co charter combined with our, uh, our care program and a care premium program for, for, for our key clients, 
you know, I think we are making, uh, making progress. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, so a, a couple questions now relating to uh, Mr. Gernhardt's speech this morning that is also coming from the audience. So uh, Mr. Gernhardt said that, uh, that, that, that shipping lines are more capable at, at asset and network management and, uh, and should leave supply chain logistics to, uh, to, the, to the three PLs. Uh, that's that's uh, that's one question. And then after that, I wanted to ask you about the other one of the other points that he made, which is that he thinks uh, that that actually carriers should be able to that 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 a, a more premium market awaits carriers if you're willing to provide it. So they're sort of somewhat related. Um, but uh, but but do you agree with his sort of his fundamental point that 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 really that that carriers do certain things well, three PLs do other things well, and and they should uh, sort of leave. Uh, leave those respective uh, areas to each other. I, I very much share that view. I mean, we consider uh, 3PLs and freight forwarders uh, our customers, and and you know what they can do for for for, for the shippers, uh, especially uh, smaller shippers, is is not something that we can uh, we can replicate in uh, uh, in as a carrier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then uh, another question came from the audience, which is which is chassis. So so when we were putting together uh, this the, the 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 program for this conference, which you know last July August, we thought, oh well, we don't really need to talk about chassis again. We've talked about chassis year after year after year. The audience must be getting horribly bored with all of our discussions about chassis. Uh, you know how wrong were we? Uh, because you know the, you know the chassis shortages you know exploded last fall and. Uh, and so, so the question that's coming from the audience is, uh, will Maersk uh, ever go back to managing chassis in order to improve that aspect of, of this, this, that aspect of the business? Or is the trend going to be uh, di to continue to divest from chassis and leave chassis management to others? We clearly believe that, uh, that uh, leaving chassis management to, to, uh, to let's say, pool, uh, pool operators is, is the more effective way uh, of getting high asset utilization in, in, in chassis, and and I'm I'm happy to see that uh, you know that the companies that that are in that business, uh, you know, direct chassis link that we sold uh, our chassis to in on the east coast, and and others will be speaking uh, uh, here at the, at this event, and even uh, some of my uh, old colleagues from from Maersline that are today uh, working in those com companies. Yep. Uh, a, a question, just going back to the subject of the really big ships, the 18,000 TGs, even, even 14,000, you know, sort of the, the, the ships called, sort of called mega ships. Uh, you know, we've seen with uh, some, over the last couple of years, we've seen, you know, catastrophic uh, accidents break out, we've seen fires break out, you know, where, you know, virtually the entire ship and all the cargo are, uh, uh, are you know, are destroyed. Uh, you know, and, and oftentimes the, what, what appears to be the case is that, is that not always does the carrier know exactly what cargo is being put on its ship, that, that, that cargo is being misdeclared. Uh, you know, you don't know uh, the, necessarily the type of cargo. It could be dangerous. It could lead to a fire. You may not be able to put out a fire if it's deep in your hold. You know, how much is this a concern to you as the, as the ships get bigger and to what degree uh, are, is uh, you know, misdeclaration of cargo still you know, an issue that you're dealing with? You know, the safety of our, our crews, our ships, and, uh, and, uh, and the cargo on board is, of course, the very first priority we have uh, every day. I think we have built a global transportation system based on containers that is hugely effective and hugely uh, cost efficient, uh, but it does rely on one important point is, and that is that the, the shipper declares uh, what's inside the con uh, container and, and you know, the weight of the container and, 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 and so on. And, and that level of trust, if we cannot have that, frankly, global trade would, uh, would break down. From time to time, we have, uh, we have issues, and, and certainly we've also had uh, our share of, of issues in mass line with uh, containers uh, catching fire or, or things like that. But, but thankfully, we, we have been able to avoid, um, avoid uh, you know, big catastrophes. And uh, I can only encourage all, all shippers to, to bear in mind that the, that the safety of, 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 the, of, the, of the people on board, of the, of the ship, and, and of the cargo depend on them playing by the rules in terms of 
uh, declaring in detail what's actually inside the container so that we can make the appropriate uh, storage arrangements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another, another question from the, uh, from, from the audience has to do with, uh, uh, has to do with uh, you know, terminals that you now, of course, APM terminals, you, they're, they're a sister company within, within Maersk. But the question is, how do you drive uh, service both short-term and long-term uh, when calling terminals that, that, that you don't own and that you don't have a, a sister company relationship with? You know, we are we are we are customer of uh, of container terminals around the world, and uh, you know, container terminals just like carriers like to generally, at least, <laughs> try to treat their their customers well. And of course, we will use whatever leverage we can uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to negotiate with terminals. And frankly, sometimes it's easier if it's not a sister company. So. <laughs> yep. Um, when you uh, when it, when it when it comes to uh, uh, you know uh, the, the you know the supply and demand balance over the next over the next couple of years, are you uh, anticipating that there's going to be overcapacity for the? Is that is that an assumption that that, that there will be overcapacity in in, uh, in in coming years? In which case, how long do you think overcapacity will last, or is it just a, a chronic state of the industry, and 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 you really it's it's pretty much indefinite until until something might change? I don't actually think about it that way. Uh, I think it, that if we're trying to run a business, trying to hit a spot where there's uh, excess demand and, and not enough capacity, uh, you know, then we can be waiting for a very long time. We got to build a business that can uh, that can manage. Uh, to turn a profit or a reasonable return in, 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 a, in, a, in a scenario of constant, uh, constant overcapacity. Overcapacity is the most likely uh, outcome of, of, of what we see. And uh, frankly, most industries live in, 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 a, in, a, in a situation where you know, capacity is not really, I mean, that's, there, there will always be enough uh, capacity. We need to get good enough at the, at pricing our services so that we can we can uh, we're not just waiting for once every ten years where there's by some uh, some some crazy thing has happened and uh, and we suddenly have uh, more demand than we have capacity. Mm -hmm. And and that and that goes back to the uh, the the other point that that, that Mr. Gernhardt mentioned this this morning is do do you see a scope for for more premium services in container shipping? Can you are there opportunities for you to provide a service that is a cut above? Uh, just a more basic service and be able to charge for that and, and, and be paid a premium for that service? You know, a number of, of uh, let's say, uh, very big customers actually do, uh, do talk about being willing to, to pay more for, 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 uh, for a better quality service. And, and you know, I, I hope that we, we will see attempts to, to establish that. In our case, we did... Uh, we did a, a, a major uh, attempt with uh, a daily MERS product in the Asia Europe service um, back in, in 2011, 2012, uh, providing a daily service, uh, more than 95% uh, uh, on-time delivery of the cargo and so on. And uh, our, our experience was that we were operationally able to deliver on our promises, but our experience was also that, that the, uh, the customers, frankly, were not willing to pay, pay, pay for it. And we had a lot of extra costs for delivering that level of, of reliability. So, so you know, we, we had to change our, our, our strategy uh, a bit. But uh, who knows? I mean, uh, it would be good for the industry if, if you had uh, a differentiated, uh, the ability to sell a differentiated uh, service product. Right, but it sounds like for the moment, I mean, you, ba that you tried that, that you, you that that was an idea you had, and you actually made some investment to see yes. if that would be possible. But it turned out that that the that the market was not willing to support that investment. Do you, do you do you think that any is anything changing in the market that that might indicate that now might be different from when that it, time was? It, it could be. I mean, we're certainly watching what's going on. If I'm not mistaken, there's actually Matt's on a carrier here that's running a uh, 
uh, a faster service uh, yeah. from, from Asia, and you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we ran an article about, about Matson just, just last week with some you know, really high praise for, that, for, the, for the quality of that service, basically mm -hmm. that they avoided pretty much all the congestion that's been in the headlines out here for the last, uh, you know, the last several months that that, that that was not experienced by their shippers. Uh, so um, the, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the Panama Canal. So, so two years ago when you were here, you, you broke some news by saying that, that you were no longer going to use the Panama Canal for Asia to U.S. East Coast services. You said you couldn't make it work profitably uh, given the, the limitations on the ship sizes that are able to go through the Panama Canal. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, 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 my colleague uh, Peter Leach reported the other day of the, of the Panama Canal saying that, that, that they will, they will ex open the canal expansion probably by no later than April 1, 2016. What, can you tell us about what your plans are for, for when that happens? Will you, what will change for, in terms of your service offerings? You know, we, uh, it's for us, uh, we, we, we're basically just pleased that there's an alternative to the Suez Canal, and uh, hopefully we can leverage that to get lower prices and, 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 and take out cost. Um, uh, so, so for us, it's, it's uh, definitely uh, definite good news. It gives us more. Uh, more, more, uh, more ways of covering the uh, Asia to U.S. East Coast market, and uh, mm -hmm. and hopefully that will help us to continue our quest to drive down cost. So you're expecting that you will return to the you know the sort of the traditional all water market uh, uh, at some point sh shortly after the uh, the we, canal is expanded. We will do, any, we, any we will do what makes most economic sense. Yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, North South trades, Sealand. How's it going? What can you tell us so far? You know, I'm going to be a lot wiser uh, by Wednesday this week because I'm visiting the team in, uh, in Florida uh, uh, later this week. But, uh, you know, we're off, to, uh, we're off to, I think, what is a, is a fairly decent start. And uh, we've converted a lot of customers in the Inter-Americas trade to the, to the Sealand, uh, Bill of Lading and Sealand brand. And, uh, you know, we're moving on uh, as, as per our, our schedule and plan. But it's still... Uh, very, uh, very early days. Very early days. Okay, good. Um, you know, one of the things that we, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Naram and Berevich talked about earlier today was uh, a little bit about, about geopolitical risk. He mentioned, uh, he mentioned the Ukraine crisis uh, and, uh, and some other things that are going on around the world. You know, it's, it's a, you know, on one hand, uh, you know, you've got, as he said, the U.S. economy is doing well, the Europe economy is beginning to do better, China is slowing. But at the same time, there's 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 hot there's geopolitical hotspots in the world right now. There's uh, you know there's there's ISIS in the Middle East. There's there's the Ukraine crisis. Uh, 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 Africa is, is 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 unstable in certain parts. What 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 is the, the the what does it mean for Maersk? What is the how do you look at geopolitical risk? How does it figure into your thinking and your strategy? Clearly. Clearly, we uh, we monitor the situation and uh, and uh, and follow what's going on and and, and certainly from a, a safety perspective, just for one, we we're concerned about what's going on. But but of course, also from a trade strategy uh, uh, point of view, I mean, many of these ge geopolitical risks. I mean, there's very little very little we can do about it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so it, you know. It's interesting, but but we need to still continue to uh, could continue to trade, and uh, that's generally what we will try to do. That our approach will be to to continue to serve a market as long as we possibly can, because we we do realize the importance we play in the uh, uh, in the economy. And last year we had a you know we had a big uh, uh, issue with Ebola in 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 West Africa. We continue to serve. Uh, the three markets uh, in question with ships, uh, even though it, it did actually cost us a lot of money to do so, because we we suddenly had to add more ships to the to the services because other West African nations didn't want to have ships uh, that came from Ebola uh, area. So you know that that's that's our role. That's yep. what we do. Good. Um, and, and you know the other thing I noticed from from the from the discussion this morning was that uh, that Nariman was. He, he was somewhat bullish for global growth this year. He said, you know, he said that global growth is going to pick up this year, uh, and trade growth is going to is going to pick up along with it. Uh, but there you were in the uh, in the FT the other day, 
uh, you know, saying that, that you saw growth kind of on the lower side of, of your range. And, and, it, and, and it seems that, there's, that, that you were not necessarily in full agreement with you know, what, what Nariman certainly was saying this I'm morning. I'm not so sure, actually. I, I, I noticed that uh, Nariman said that uh, the multiplier has w have come down a lot. Yeah. I mean, so we, we used to say global GDP times two, and now he said uh, global GDP plus uh, 50 percent, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know that's actually probably if you have global growth of uh, two and a half uh, percent or three percent, then we're not way off the the four percent that I suggested in terms of uh, trade growth. If you look at growth. 2012, 13, 14 has averaged just under 4% in container demand. So, um, so, so the point I wanted to make in, 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 the, in the FT was that, you know, it's very unlikely that we're going to get back to, to organic growth rates of uh, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10%. And, and, you know, we need to factor that in when we make our, when we make our, our investment decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, because when if you buy too much capacity, if the market is growing 10%, you know you, you can work your way out of it fairly quickly. But if you if the market is only going three or four percent, it's going to take quite a lot longer mm -hmm. before you 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 get get good utilization. So that was just the point I was trying to make. Net net, uh, we agree very much with uh, Nariman's conclusions that uh, the. Um, the fall in the oil price is positive for global container demand. Of course, there are markets where it's definitely not positive, such as West Africa, such as the east coast of South America, uh, you know, the Persian Gulf, and so on. But the enormous transfer of wealth from the oil-producing countries to, 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 to Europe, to the US, to China, to Japan, will be net-net positive for, for container demand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Uh, so, so we just, you know, we just went through this, uh, you know, ca you know, ca cataclysmic uh, uh, labor management uh, standoff here on the West Coast. Uh, the, you know, the the, the sh ships are stacked up, you know, off off uh, LA Long Beach as we speak. Uh, we had uh, uh, Matt Shea, the the head of the the Retailer Federation, at lunch saying uh, this can't be allowed to happen again. Uh, is, is, is it just the way it is that this is how the longshoremen and the management negotiate in the U.S. and that, and that we're likely to see uh, a repeat of, of this type of disruption whenever these two groups get together? Uh, or do you think there's a different way that might, that might we be able to uh, uh, figure out a, a way so that, so that these two parties can get together and negotiate a new contract but do so without a way that's going to that's gonna hurt uh, not only carriers who you know who have expensive ships uh, idled off the coast, but also thousands of your customers uh, who are you know who are you know missing out on ep economic op opportunities because of that. I just have to say that I, I can only say that I agree that that uh, you know it's it was a very unfortunate situation and uh, that we should really take the time now to to evaluate what happened, what went wrong. Is there a way to avoid this in the future? If we had any good ideas on that point, I would have certainly applied them in the contract negotiations that we have just, we have just completed, uh, because I don't think it's in anybody's interest to have a collective bargaining agreement that takes nine months and ends in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a lot of uh, disruption. So I hope that we, both on labor and on management side, will, will take the opportunity now to review what what, what, what happened, what went wrong, and, and, and see if we can determine another way, uh, another way forward. But I also have to admit, I, I don't see any, I don't have any good ideas right now. Mm -hmm. um, how, how big are ships going to get? Are they going to continue to just get bigger and bigger? We, we, you know, the new, occasionally the news you hear that, that ships of 22, 25,000 TEUs are on, the, are on the drawing board. Is it, is, is, will, will they indefinitely get bigger? as they have been getting bigger so far? Um, let's say we have, today the largest ships are 18, 19,000 TU ships. And um, I'm sure that uh, the shipyards will continue to work on the design and, and, and squeeze more boxes on those ships within the principal dimensions of 400 meters long and, 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 and 59 meters wide and so on. 
uh, and then the next generation will be 25,000 TU ships. Mm -hmm. From, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to take either a sharp increase in demand growth or uh, it's, that's what it would take to, to go to a, a 25,000 TU uh, size. Just from a practical point of view, in Maersline's case, we load 55,000 TU per week from Asia to North Europe. So that's enough to fill two strings with 25,000 TU ships if we were using that. And obviously, that's not a competitive product from a, from a, from a frequency point of view. I think the analogy is that the airline industry, you know, they, from the late 60s until five years ago, you know, a jumbo jet 747 Boeing with uh, 350 passengers was considered, you know, the most optimal plane from a, both from a cost per seat point of view, but also from a, let's say, trading flexibility point of view. And that's mm -hmm. clearly where I see us being with the, with the, you know, the triple E size of 18, 19,000 TU. And whether you add 500 more or less, I think that's, you know, that's, that's optimization and, 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 and evolution. Mm -hmm. The next generation is going to be 25,000 to you, but it's going to be quite a while before we get to that. Yep, OK. Um, another question that we have concerns the sort of upcoming, uh, upcoming service contract negotiations here in the, in the Trans-Pacific. So, yes. So the, uh, the, this, is, uh, this, this conference is timed to sort of the beginning of that cycle. Uh, the carriers have been uh, very aggressive over the last uh, couple months uh, in, in the raising rates. The carriers have been what? aggressive in, in seeking How's rate that? increases? No. no, is that not true? <laughs> uh, I talked to Brian, uh, who I see right over here earlier, saying that the carriers think that there's an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to jack up the rates. Are you, uh, are you, uh, is, that, is, that, is that accurate? What's, what, what, do you, what do you predict is going to happen over the next couple months? I, I think that, uh, that uh, the prices will go up this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Care to elaborate? <laughs> so you know, but I mean, it's it's you know, it's the it's it's it's, it's the supply and demand uh, of the trade. I mean, the spot rates from from Asia to from Asia to the U.S. East Coast are north of uh, five thousand dollars. I mean, for sure, that's going to mean that this contract rates are going to go up. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I'm not an expert, expert on Pacific, and I don't participate right. uh, in the contract negotiations as, as mm -hmm. such. But as far as I can, I can see, you know, the, the supply and demand uh, balance is uh, right now in a, in, in a situation where, you know, uh, that uh, freight rates are, are more than likely to, uh, to go up. Mm -hmm. What about the, uh, the, 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 the East Coast ports? So we, we did a survey, which somebody mentioned earlier, of, of uh, you know, over, over 100 BCOs. Just, I think it was last week that we, we did the survey. Anyway, that, you know, 65% of them said that they're going to be diverting some cargo to the, to the East Coast just because the, the trust in the West Coast has evaporated after this whole thing. Um, can, can the East Coast, Coast ports handle it? Is those, I mean, the, the, they're, they're smaller ports. They're, they're, not, they're not as big as the ports out here. Uh, the Panama Canal is going to be expanding. Uh, do you do you have concerns along those lines? It's clear from uh, discussions with our customers that that many are considering their their long term uh, strategy when it comes to uh, to which ports to use and and how to how to get the goods into the U.S. Um, and for that matter, also exporters looking at how which gateways uh, they want to use, and uh, many customers express the view that, uh, that you know, we cannot put all our eggs in one basket. Uh, and it, especially not if that basket is uh, uh, Long Beach or LA. Uh, so uh, so I, I do think it will, this current situation that we have just gone through will have some long-term uh, long impact on, on, on volume growth. Uh, so, you know, you, there's the Canadian Gateway Lazaro Cadenas in Mexico is, is clearly gearing up to, to take more volume into the U.S. Gulf. You have mm -hmm. the East Coast. Uh, you, know, you, you even have long-term perspectives on where companies decide to do their, their manufacturing. Uh, you know, if you move the manufacturing to Mexico from Asia, you don't actually have to involve any ports. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, I, I, 
this this situation we've had in the last uh, uh, in the last nine months probably will have some ramifications as far as uh, as far as uh, California is concerned. Um, clearly, the East Coast ports is going to see this as a business opportunity, and and you know many of them have done a really really good job uh, in in this uh, uh, in this current situation in terms of picking up uh, uh, new business. Mm -hmm. But you know, at the end of the day, it's our customers that decide which gateway, which gateway they want to use, and 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 we will serve the, serve them there. Mm -hmm. Good. And so, just sort of to begin to wrap this up, because you know, because we we only have a, we only have a couple of minutes together. It's amazing how quickly an hour goes by. Um, what 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 worries you? What 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 keeps you up at night? <laughs> you know, from from a, a mass line specific uh, perspective, uh, you know, we we. Uh, we work hard to, to continue to, to improve our, our, our service. I think we as an industry have enormous amount of opportunity for, for standardizing and for automating uh, transactions uh, between us uh, going into the uh, digital age. And, and that would require a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of heavy lifting for us to, to, to achieve that. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly for all carriers, the, the, the lack of top line growth is, is, a, is a big issue. So over the last four or five years, you know, volumes have grown four or five percent per year, but, but top lines have actually not grown. And that, that con puts a constant pressure on us to, to, to become more efficient and take, take cost out. So, so that's, uh, that's, of course, a, a, a tough job. So those are some of the things that I uh, spent most of my time on. Good. Very good. When we're not thinking about how to increase prices in Pacific, of course. Very good. Okay. Yes. I'm, I can imagine how that would uh, that would be on your mind right now. <laughs> um, well, good. Um, any anything that you'd like to say, Soren? Just just in, in we've got just a couple minutes. You know, we've we've gone over a very wide range of topics, and 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 you've been very. Uh, uh, a very, very articulate, very expansive, and so it's been really, really interesting listening to what you uh, to what you have to say. I I don't have a lot to add except that uh, to say uh, to all of those that are customers here, thank you very much for uh, for your business. We'll do whatever we can to 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 serve you well. We are here today, and we're going to be here tomorrow and the day after tomorrow to to fulfill our mission in terms of facilitating. Uh, facilitating global, global trade. I think it's quite daunting to be uh, in, in a room like this full of uh, uh, transportation uh, professionals and, and uh, that all of you want to hear what I have to say. So thank you for listening. Uh, we'll continue to be there. Good. Well, Soren, and I could just say on behalf of uh, uh, all of my colleagues at, at the JOC, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. It's, uh, uh, you're, you're being you know, extremely uh, you know, open and, and, and sharing your views. And I'm sure that, that I know that I learned a lot just from listening to you and, and hearing what you say. I'm sure that many others in the audience did as well. So uh, please, how about a, a nice round of applause for Soren Stowe? Thank you.